نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري و یسر لي امری و احلل اقدتا من لساني یفقه قولي و جعل لي وزیر من اخلي اللهم فکهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم إني أسألك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متكبلا آمين ثم آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سورة النحل This سورة was revealed in the period of مكة It has 16 stanzas and 128 verses and is the 16th by the order of arrangement of the surahs in Quran. The name of the surah is because in verse 68, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْحَا رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ Allah has mentioned about the Nahl, which is the Arabic name for the honeybee and that is why it gets the name of surah Nahl. The period of revelation is the end of the second or the third period of the stay of Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. And this was the period when opposition was in full force. The verse 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ هَجْرُوا فِي اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا زُوَلِمُ shows that the immigration to Abyssinia had taken place. And uh, verse 106 in which Allah has said, man kafara, man kafara billahi min ba'di imanihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he shows here that there was a period of intense persecution and uh, where there were chances that someone might just revert under this pressure. So this verse was revealed. And in then verse 112 to 114, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرِيَةً And uh, so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here clearly points that the famine after the prophethood of Prophet ﷺ had passed away. So all this clearly proves that the surah was revealed in the last part of the stay in Mecca. The main points or the summary of the points which have been explained in the surah is number one, eradication of polytheism that is finding partners with Allah and then there are proofs of monotheism that is oneness of Allah and Allah has talked about the results and the punishments of failure of uh, believing in prophethood and the penalties of disbelieving in the truth and the true teachings of Quran and Hadith. In the verse Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ata amrullahi fala tasta'ajiluhu subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. The command of Allah is coming, so be not impatient for it. Exalted is he and high above what they associate with him. So in the first verse, right at the start of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has very clearly and very strictly negated all forms of polytheism and finding partners and associating them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah has said, فَلَا تَسْتَحْجِلُهُ Allah has told them not to be impatient. Who is Allah asking not to be impatient for the command of Allah? This is all about that the people of Mecca, when they were obstinately refusing the invitation of Prophet Sallallahu they would ask him that you give us the threat that all those who fail to believe will be punished. So go ahead, get the torment which you are scaring us off. And secondly, they were very arrogant and uh, they used to ask that if we disbelieve, then why hasn't the curse and torment of Allah struck us till now? So here in this verse, Allah is answering, Allah is negating and warning all such people in this verse. Moreover, if uh, we relate, there is another order here also when Allah says, فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُوهُ 
then there is Allah and there is a don't of Quran for being what? For being impatient or for doing any form of indecent haste. La tastajiluhu is what Quran says and what Prophet said, al ajilatumina shaitan, that all forms of impatient behaviors or all forms of indecent hastes are from shaitan. Remember, Quran, Islam, our religion teaches us and approves of moderation in all spheres of life and disappears of extremism in all things in all forms of activities. And therefore, neither is laziness liked nor indecent haste or impatience has been approved. But today, if we look around, we see impatience in all, all spheres of life, like to become the desire to become successful and rise overnight, to become a millionaire in a few days, to be promoted to a senior post soon after joining a job. On the roads, impatiently blowing the horn if the driver ahead stops for just a while, getting restless for paying the bills while standing in a queue, indecent tastes, and above all, in all matrimonial matters also. A girl, after she gets married, she immediately starts expecting that within a few days, her husband would give up all his relations and just keep on dancing around her only. Stop listening to his mother, stop relating to his sister and start doing what she dictates. How is this possible? He has, he has spent a lifetime maybe full 25 years with his family. She would need time to prove her worth, to, to gain his love, affection, attention, confidence. She starts expecting that the whole system of life should change according to her wishes and requirements, and the system starts revolving around her desires. This is practically not possible. The system will change, surely will change but it will need time, it will need patience. A girl gets married. You must have heard, you must have seen such things happening around you. A girl getting married, lavish functions and events and immense spending, but within a few days, she comes up saying, I just can't stay there. I can't just get along. Can't carry on the relationship any longer. This is indecent haste. Stay patient, just see and show, just experience and let others know, give time to understand and to be understood. Marital bond needs what? Effort, time, patience for it to grow and flourish. Similarly, in-laws get impatient also. A girl weds, joins the family, and the mother-in-law starts expecting that she will take up the whole system and she will take up all the responsibilities and she will take up all the commitments in a very short period. How is it possible? If the mother-in-law thinks and relates, her own daughter took so many years learning the duties in her childhood, despite the fact that she was born and bred in the family. So how can an outsider start doing that in a couple of weeks? We need to be patient, stay cool, give time, give breathing space, just ignore and let go. Like if I give you an example of a new plant which we bring in our gardens, what happens? When we plant this new plant in our courtyard or in our garden, it doesn't start growing or flowering the day we bring it. No, it doesn't. In fact, for the first few days, it just withers down. At this stage, do we pull it out? Do we pull it out and throw it away? No, we don't do that. We just stay patient and we care. We protect it. We water it. We nourish it. And then slowly and steadily it starts growing. And finally it grows into a beautiful flowering plant, a lovely flowering bush or a wonderful blossoming creeper. And this gives scent, and this adds the color, and this adds the beautiful green view to our courtyards. 
So this is where we are. We need to be patient and we need to be tolerant. And then you see, even in matters of religion, there is indecent haste, desire to get forgiveness of all the sins and reward of Jannah with just worship of a single night. You know what? This has led to the fabrication of many innovations in religion. And then we do come across with people showing hurry to learn about all the messages of Quran and Hadith in a short course when I invite them to a two-year program of the commentary of Quran and of the translation of Quran. You know what they say? Oh, two years? Don't you people have a short course, a two-month short course? By the way, this session of the month of Ramzan, which we are going through here, the commentary of the complete Quran is actually a short course for the comprehension of Quran. Stay connected and invite others. Verse number two, Allah says, he sends down the angels with the inspiration of his command upon whom he wills. Of his servants telling them, one, that there's no deity except me, so fear me. In this verse, the word ruh, it means three Three things it means. Number one, the soul of the body, which is responsible for the life in the body. The second thing is the revolutions which were sent down to the prophets by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third, ruh. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this word, sometimes it refers to Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam, the leader of the angels. You will see that in some verses, only one meaning will fit in. And uh, where in others, all the three meanings will be fitted in. Like in this verse, if you see all the three meanings fit in here. And also in this uh, verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again warning against the finding of partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in verse number three to verse number 16, Allah is mentioning his blessings on his bondsmen. He created the heavens and the earth in truth. High is he about what they associate with him. He created man from a sperm drop. Then at once he is a clear adversary. And the grazing livestock he has created for you in them is warmed and numerous benefits and from them you eat. And for you in them is the enjoyment of beauty when you bring them for the bring them in for the evening and when you send them out to the pasture and they carry your loads to a land you could not have reached except with difficulty to yourselves. Indeed, your Lord is kind and merciful. And he created the horses, the mules, and the donkeys for you to ride as an adornment. And he created, he created which you do not know. And upon Allah is the direction of the right way. Allahumma ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. And among the various paths are those deviating. And if he willed, he could have guided you all. It is he who sends down rain from the sky, and from it is drink, and from it is foliage in which you pasture animals. Allah is the creator, and he is also the provider and the sustainer. Being the creator, he provides sustenance for all his creations. He causes to grow for you thereby the crops olives, palm trees, grape vines, from all the fruits. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who give thought. And he has subjected for you the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, and the stars are subjected by his command. Indeed, in that are signs for the people who reason. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that all the heavenly bodies are in a strict control of Allah. This is to create the day and night for the comfort of the superior being for all of us. Subhanallah. 
the verse teaches us and reminds us of what? That all these creations stay obedient to you for you to be obedient to your Allah. All these creations made to serve you for you to serve Allah. And he has subject, subjected whatever he multiplied for you on the earth of varying colors. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who remember. Allahumma ja'alla minhum. And it is he who subjected the sea for you to eat from it tender meat and to extract from it ornaments which you wear. Seafood, the best food and best in like almost all the aspects. And from the oceans, we get pearls and we get jewels. The oyster, the oyster itself is a miracle of Allah. Deep down in the ocean bed, fathoms and fathoms of water and darkness. And in the shell, a tiny worm. Who taught it to make the pearls for us? A tiny sand particle enters its shell, irritates its body, and the secretions pour out of its body, coat the sand particle. And then the pressure over the years miraculously converts it into a smooth, shining pearls, which again, the deep sea divers, they hunt out for all of us. Subhanallah. And on the same sea, what else is there? You see the ships plowing through it, and he subjected it that you may seek of his bounty and perhaps you be grateful. Allahumma ja'alli sabura wa ja'alli shakura. The same sea giving us food, the same sea giving us all forms of ornaments, and on the same sea, the sailing ship, one of the best means of communication and transport. Have you ever thought what a miracle, what a miracle the ship is? A tiny needle, it sinks when it is, it's placed on water. But a huge sip, it sails, it floats. This is Allah. Allah, while creating water, gave it its property of surface tension, buoyancy, and upward thrust. For he who was all-knowing, he knew that he would he would want the ships to sail on water for the human beings. Subhanallah. And he, he has cast into the earth firmly set mountains, lest it sh a shift with you and made rivers and roads that you may be guided. Many times in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about alqiya fil arzi ravasi that he has casted the mountains firmly set. What is this all about? Let me just go back about the creation, the history of the creation of the earth itself. You know, when the earth was created, it was a ball of fire. It was in a gaseous form. And slowly and steadily it cooled down to an extremely hot molten ball. And this molten form of the earth, which it was in, it still exists in the core of the earth inside the mantle. The outermost layer, as which we see, is the crust. It is the soil. Inside this is the main mantle of the earth, and this is the middle layer. And the innermost layer, which is the core, this is still a ball of fire. Now, when the earth was semi-solid and it was in a molten stage, the earth would wobble while it was rotating. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the mountains at calculated specified points to prevent the earth from wobbling and to make the rotatory movement of the earth extremely smooth. Why? So that we who live on the surface of the earth are not uncomfortable because the movement and because the wobbling movement of the earth. You know what? We living on the earth are in a continuous state of travel and motion. The earth rotating on its axis and revolving in its orbits, but all is so smooth that we just don't realize, we just don't feel 
anything at all. Subhanallah. We do know that we, when we are traveling a few kilometers for a few hours, even in the most comfortable of cars, we get tired, we get fatigued. But here on the earth, covering hundreds and hundreds of kilometers in a few minutes, no exhaustion, no fatigue, and above all, no feeling of traveling or motion at all. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar. And then these mountains, the geologists, they confirm what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, saying here also, that these mountains have been cast firmly in the, in the land. The geologists say and they confirm that they have been set, the mountains have been set or they have been grouted in the earth like a nail. They have been grouted in the earth like nails. And the geologists and the geological studies, they tell us that all the mountains are embedded firmly in the underlying land. As much as the mountain rises above the ground, they are embedded under the ground to the same depth also. And this is all to make them stable. And then between the mountains for the people to travel through the mountains, Allah has created mountain paths. Like the verse here mentions the roads that you may be guided. Moreover, mountains are also a source of flowing rivers because we know that the springs, the springs on the mountains, they are the source and origin of the rivers. And you know what? The sloping surface of the mountains gives the flowing river, the flowing water of the rivers gives its the velocity and the speed to keep on flowing on the surface of the earth. Subhanallah, how intricately connected all these things are. And yet more to it, the mountains with high snow clad peaks are the actual reservoir of water for the melting snow in the summers. More than that, mountains are an immense source. They are an immense source and a reservoir of all forms of minerals and gold and stones and oil and gas. Subhanallah, this is Allah, our creator, our sustainer, who has planned, he has provided for us. Allahumma ja'alni saburam wa ja'alni shakura. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us the recognition of your attributes and your blessings and bless us with firm belief and faith. Rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana zanubana wa kina zaabun nar. Verse 16, and landmarks and by the stars they are also guided. Stars are a source of guidance, like the North Star. This is the best and the most convenient form of a navigational guide. Allah has provided for our physical guidance, for the guidance of all the travelers while they are traveling. Not only this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also provided us for our spiritual guidance, has guided us for our journey of life and for our journey to prepare for the journey of hereafter, handing us over this book, this divine scripture and saying and announcing, and then Allah says in Quran, Hadainahun In this book, in this Quran, we have guided you to two routes. One going towards the Jannah, your destination, the destination of all the Mormons and Muslims, and one the path which might roll down the disbelievers towards the hell pit. And then he is he who creates like one who does not create. So will you not be reminded? And in this verse number 18, Allah 
sums up the message of all the previous verses and Allah says, وَعِنْ تُعُدُّ نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُهَا And if you should count the favors of Allah, you cannot enumerate them. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. The blessings of Allah, countless, endless, innumerable. He blesses us with more than what we ask for. And he blesses us with more than we are even aware of. That is why Prophet Sallallahu has asked us all, be grateful for five things before five things. Five conditions, five states. We need to be thankful and grateful to Allah. Before we end up with five, youth before old age, health before illness, free time before getting busy, affluence before poverty, and life before death. Prophet Sallallahu has taught us the supplication which he used to recite even after the Salah. Rabbi a'ini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura wa ja'alni fi aini saghira wa fi a'yunin nasi qabira. And Allah knows what you conceal and what you declare. And those they invoke other than Allah create nothing. They themselves are created. Uh, they are in fact dead, not alive, and they do not perceive when they will be resurrected. Your God is one God, but those who do not believe in hereafter, their hearts are disapproving and they are arrogant. So the verse clearly explains that the cause of disapproving belief and disbelieving is what? Arrogance. And what is arrogance in the sight of Allah? Verse 23, Allah says, Assuredly, Allah knows what they conceal and what they declare. Indeed, he does not like the arrogant. Allah says, Innahu la yuhibbul mustaqbirin. Innahu means that indeed he no doubt he, for sure he, who Allah, does not do what? La yuhibu. He does not love whom? Al-mustakbirin. All those who are arrogant. Arrogant, remember, arrogance is not only disliked or disapproved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is no doubt the greatest and the only who is the greatest, but arrogance will deprive the bondsman from the love of Allah. Arrogance will cause the name of the bondsman being struck off from the list of the loved ones of Allah. Because pride is an attribute not befitting anyone except Allah. Hazrat Abu Sayyid Qudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They have reported that Prophet sallallahu said that Allah has announced might is his garment and pride is his cloak. Whoever seeks to compete or to share it with Allah, then Allah will be revengeful for him. And in other words, the words say that Allah says and announces and declares that I will punish him. Remember, anyone who tries to be arrogant or he puts himself or tries to put himself above others and Allah will bring him down to lowest and will humiliate him. Hazrat Amr ibn Shuaib who he reports in Tirmidhi that Prophet said that on the day of resurrection, People who were arrogant, they will be raised as tiny ants. Those tiny white goldenish ants, these are the tiniest and they are the, they are the minutest creatures which are visible to the naked eye. And Prophet Salaam has given the simile that arrogant people who try to, who try to act very arrogant, they will be raised as tiny ants. And humiliation will overwhelm them from all the sides. And then they will be driven to a prison of hellfire called Wallace. And the companions asked him what Wallace was. 
he told that it was a low lying place in hellfire where the pus and the blood and the fluid of the wounds of the inmates of hellfire will just collect. And this will be a place where the fire of the hell will be hottest and it will be rising over them and they will be given this drink of the inmates. Tatina Tulkhebal, which will be all these fluids draining from the bodies of the inmates of hellfire. Allahumma ajirna mina nar. Allahumma ajirna mina nar. Allahumma ajirna mina nar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, La yuhibbu man kana muhtalan fakhura. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love those people who are arrogant, who are proud, who are pompous. Arrogance is an extremely disliked state. To be exalted and to be the sovereign and to be the mighty, they are all the attributes of Allah. And he does not let anyone share his attributes of greatness especially. Hazrat Abdullah bin Mathud ta'ala, and who reports in Muslim that Prophet said, La man qana fi min qibr. Anyone who has arrogance like the weight of a seed will not enter paradise. So we need to realize what arrogance is. Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood ta'ala, and who reports in Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, was asked by one of the companions that we all like to wear nice clothes and nice shoes and hold a nice lash in our hands. Is this kibr? Is this arrogance? Prophet وسلم, answered, Verily, Allah is beautiful and he likes beauty. This is not kibr. Instead, he explained what kibr was. Batar al-haq wa nas. Batar al-haq means rejection or refusal of the truth. Truth of Quran, truth of the teachings of hadith. Batar al-haq wa nas. Qantun nas means looking down upon, looking down upon people. So this is what arrogance is. And what is the punishment of those who are arrogant? Allah says, Alaysa Jahannam Maswa Lil Mutakabirin. And I've already narrated that in Jahannam they will be where in the ballas and they will be presented with what? With Dinatul Khibal. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu alay. We do find stories of arrogant people and how they were punished in their lives. The first arrogance was exhibited by whom? By shaitan. When Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah ordered and he said, Wa is qala rabbuka lil mala'ikka tisjudu li adama fasajadu illa iblis. All the angels and Iblis, they were ordered to prostrate for Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And all of them, Fasajadu, all the angels, they prostrated. But Iblis, Abba, he refused to obey the order of Allah. And he did what? Was takbara. And because of was takbara, what happened? How did he end up? Waqana min al kafirin. He was labeled as the disbelievers. So this is arrogance. Arrogance would lead to disbelief and the arrogant will be put in the list of the disbelievers. And what was the arrogance of shaitan there? Abba, he refused to accept the order of prostration. Was takbara was what? He refused to order. And secondly, he, he looked down upon Hazrat Adam Islam because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, why did not he prostrate? He said, ana khairu min. And he gave the reason for it. He said, I'm one up. And he gave the reason for it. So this is arrogance. Refusing to obey the commandments and orders of Allah and the do's and don'ts of Allah and to do what? To think that the bondsmen of Allah are one down or to have a superiority complex. And when he was arrogant, what did he end up with? He was labeled in the list of the disbelievers. Then he was said, what? He was said, minha. He was turned out of paradise. And he was labeled as maz'um madhura, the cursed one. And then Allah has said, la amla anna jahannam minkum ajba'in. That there's absolutely no doubt that Allah said that I will fill you and your followers, all of them in Jahannam. Allahumma achirna min al So this is arrogance. And then we 
read about Fir'aun and Tarun and Abu Jahl. They were all arrogant. We know how they all were punished and what was their end. Arrogance, it starts from the heart. A tiny seed of arrogance is sown, sown in the heart. And then slowly and steadily, the heart becomes the heart of an arrogant, proud, pompous person. And when the heart pumps the blood to the whole body, slowly and steadily, all the organs of the body, they start demonstrating this arrogance, the eyes, the eyes of the person, the gaze, the person starts looking down upon others. The gate of the person, as Allah has said, the gate becomes the gate of a proud person. And the gate of the servants of Allah in Surah Al-Furqan, Allah says, Ibadur Rahman, the servants of Allah are whom? Yamshuna al arzi hauna, soft gate, humbly walk. And then the face, the face becomes, the expressions become, they become arrogant. As Allah has ordered, don't turn your faces from the bondsmen. And then the conversation becomes the conversation of an arrogant person. Me, my, mine, our. And then finally the person, arrogant person, turns into an oppressor, a tyrant, a cruel, a harsh, hard-hearted person. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. So we need to learn that how, how do we need to save ourselves from this evil feeling and state of arrogance? I will be suggesting a few steps to save ourselves and to eradicate any arrogance if there is any. Number one, first of all, we need to do a very strict self-analysis. Ask ourselves, have I started feeling proud and arrogant of some of my worldly blessings, like my wealth, my riches, my jewelry, my properties, my mansions, my lodges, my, my degrees, my profession, my, my brilliant children? Huh? Ask yourself. Then ask yourself, do I ever act arrogantly? Do I ever look down upon anybody? Have I turned egoistic, conceited, self-centered? If you identify anything of the sort, if you identify anything of the sort, you need to do what? Accept. Accept, regret, repent, promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him get rid of this arrogance. The second step is zikr and remembrance of Allah. Saying alhamdulillah. All the blessings and all the guides, the bounties are for Allah. And this alhamdulillah and all the remembrance of Allah. His greatness, his attributes will inshallah take out all forms of arrogance from our hearts. And the third thing is gratitude, shukr, being grateful, being grateful for all the bounties and blessings of Allah. It is none of my credits. It is not my credit. It is what? It is the blessing of Allah. So this will instill humbleness and this will produce humbleness and remove arrogance and then another point which we learn from hadith that prophet said that anybody who is the first to greet and to say salam his heart gets pure from arrogance the heart gets purified from arrogance and then another suggestion is working with our own hands especially something which we feel we feel insulted if we if we do that do that this will be a blow to our pride and our ego anything for which i feel that i do this me doing this you must do this and then 
another suggestion is a reality check of all the things on which a person is being arrogant on. Just try to relate how temporary these things are and how short-lived all these things are. Then inshallah, the heart will definitely be purified from any forms of arrogance. For arrogance can be because of wealth and riches, bank balances and estates and mansions and lodges and beauty and knowledge and qualifications and degrees and family, the caste, the creed, the color. And sometimes, you know what? There may be arrogance on religious, on religious matters also, on, on anybody's ibadah, like the supererogatory worships may cause somebody to get arrogant on that. Salatul Tahajjud. There's a story of Hazrat Abdul Qadir Jilani and his son. They were traveling and uh, with the, they were with the caravan and the father and the son, they got up early in the morning to offer Tahajjud. And you know what the son said? He, he told his father how unlucky these people are, how unlucky and how deprived they are immediately the father corrected the son and very firmly said that they are much better than you are who is up in a state of arrogance and they are sleeping without arrogance there was uh, there was a person who was in the period after the companions atabai and he used to say that i sleep through the now, night and i get up at the first year in a state of humbleness, I would prefer than getting up for the hajjud than staying arrogant and proud throughout the day. So this is arrogance. How humble was Prophet Sallallahu He washed his clothes. He used to sweep the floor. He used to fetch the water. He used to repair or darn his own torn clothes. He used to repair and sew his old shoe. And not only he, similar were his companions. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who? He was the caliph of a huge Islamic state. And you know what? After the conquest of Baytul Maqdis, the people they said, they requested that we would want and desire that we hand over the keys to the Amirul Mu'mineen ourselves. So Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who accompanied only with one slave, he traveled from all the way from Medina and uh, on his journey, he was um, sharing his ride also. And when they reached there, he was clad in a dress which had nine to 10 patches. And four out of these patches were of leather. And the slave was riding the camel and the Mirul Mu'mineen was on foot because that is how the turn was. And the people was having difficulty to recognize who is who, who is the master and who is the servant, who is the slave. And then the great grandson, a descendant of Hazrat Umar, who? Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who was the caliph of the Umayyad. Umayyad dynasty and the Umayyad Caliphate and his period was known as the golden period of the Umayyad dynasty. How humble he was. One night, his um, slave girl, he was sleeping and the slave girl was moving the hand fan and she fell asleep also. And uh, when she fell asleep, the Caliph, Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he woke up. And what he did was that he quietly took out the fan from her hand and he started moving the fan. She got up and she was like baffled and she was so upset. And so calmly and so humbly did Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz say, so what? Why are you getting so upset? First, I was sleeping and you were moving the hand fan. And now you were sleeping and I was moving the hand fan. So doing this for your servant was like, this is humbleness. Another night, a friend who was a scholar had come to visit her. The lamp finished. 
and the light went off. The friend um, called out the slave, but Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz stopped him and he said that no, he, uh, he had gone off to sleep after a hec hectic wo uh, day's work. So uh, he didn't want to call him. And the friend, he tried to get up, but Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz told him that you are my friend and I won't let you do the job. He got up, he took the lamp, he filled it up and he lit it up again and he brought the lamp back put it down and very humbly he said you know when I left I was Umar bin Abdul Aziz and when I've come back I am still Umar bin Abdul Aziz so this is how we need to learn by working with our own hands this is what teaches us humbleness and this is humility Allah loves those who are humble and what does our salah teach us the raku the sajda, the prostration teaches us humbleness, being humble to Allah. And remember, being humble to Allah, we also need to be humble to his bondsmen. As Allah orders us, wahfiz lahuma junaha dhulli min rahma Then do what? Low down your shoulders with mercy in front of your parents. Prophet Sallallahu has taught us a beautiful supplication. Allahumma ja'alli sabura wa ja'alli shakura wa ja'alli fi aini sahira wa fi a'yunin nasi qabira. In this supplication, we are asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for gratitude, patience, and humbleness, and to take out all forms of arrogance from our hearts. Verse number 24. And when it is said to them, what has your Lord sent down? They say legends of the former people. So now after explaining uh, how Allah does not love all those who are arrogant, in the next few verses, Allah is going to mention the behavior of all those who are arrogant and is also going to mention their punishments that they may bear their own burdens in full on the day of resurrection and some of the burdens of those whom they misguided without knowledge. Unquestionably, evil is that which they bear. Those before them had already plotted, but Allah came at their building from where, from the foundations. So the roof fell upon them from above them and the punishment came to them from where they did not perceive. On the day of resurrection, he will disgrace them. Who? The arrogant people, the arrogant disbelievers. He will disgrace them and say, where are my partners for whom you used to oppose the believers? Those who were given knowledge will say, indeed, disgrace this day and evil are upon the disbelievers. The one whom the angels take in death while wronging themselves and who then offer submission saying, we were not doing any evil. But yes, indeed, Allah is knowing what you used to do. So enter the gates of hell to abide eternally therein. And how wretched is the residence of the arrogant. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. And it will be said to those who feared Allah, what did your Lord send down? They will say that which is good for those who do good in this world is good and the home of hereafter is better. And how excellent is the home of the righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of them. Rabbibni li indaka baitan fil janna. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. And what will be the home of righteous be like? Gardens of perpetual residence which they will enter beneath which rivers flow. They will have therein whatever they wish thus does Allah reward the righteous? Allahumma ja'alna minhum. 
the ones whom the angels take in death, being good and pure, the angels will say, peace be upon you, enter paradise for what you used to do. Do the disbelievers await anything except that the angels should come to them or there comes the command of your Lord? Thus did those do before them and Allah wronged them not, but they had been wronging themselves. So they were struck by the evil consequences of what they did and they were enveloped by what they used to ridicule. And those who associate others with Allah, if Allah, they say, if Allah had willed, we would not have worshipped anything other than him, neither we nor our fathers, nor would we have forbidden anything through other than him. Thus did this did those do before them? So is there upon the messenger except the duties of clear notification? Verse number 36, and we certainly sent into every nation a messenger saying, saying what? What was the message of all the messengers to all the nations? Worship Allah and avoid Tahut. What is Tarut? Tarut refers to all forces or powers or agencies which force or compel or order or motivate towards the disobedience of Allah. And Tarut may be the wishes and the desires in the mind of the person himself. It might be the intimate family, the spouse and the children. It may be the family and the clan. It may be the customs and the norms of the society, it may be the rules and the regulations and the laws of the state, or it may be the heads of the states or the leaders of the tribes themselves, which may be acting as Tahut. Remember, obedience to Tahut and obedience to Allah cannot coexist. Both are what? Inversely proportional. If there is obedience of Tahut, there will be disobedience to Allah. And if there is obedience of Allah, then there will be disobedience to Tahut. And among them were those whom Allah guided, Allahumma ja'alla minhum. And among them are those whom those upon whom error was deservedly decreed, Allahumma la taj'alla minhum. So proceed to the earth and observe how was the end of the deniers. Even if you should strive for their guidance, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, indeed Allah does not guide those who he sends astray and they will have no helpers. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al-mustaqim. And they swear by Allah, their strongest oaths that Allah will not resurrect one who dies. But yes, it is a true promise binding upon him. But most of the people do not know it is so. He will make clear to them the truth of that wherein they differ. And so those who disbelieve may know that they were liars. Indeed, our word to a thing when we intend is but that we say what? Kun, we say to it, be, and what happens for Yakun? It is. This is the power. This is the control. This is the order of Allah, which Allah is introducing. Verse 41, and those who emigrated for the cause of Allah, after they had been wronged, we will surely settle them in this world in a good place. But the reward of hereafter is greater if only they could know. So this word is uh, encouraging the Muslims of Makkah when they were being oppressed and their faith was in danger and Allah was encouraging them to emigrate. And uh, in fact, you know, emigration needs what? It needs patience and reliance. And this is what Allah mentions in the next verse. They are those who endured patiently and upon their Lord they relied. And we sent not before you except men to whom we revealed our messages. So ask the people of the messages if you do not know. We sent them with clear proofs and written ordinances, and we reveal to you the messages that you make clear to the people what was sent down to them, and that they might give a thought. Then 
Do those who have planned evil deeds feel secure that Allah will not cause the earth to swallow them or that the punishment will come to them from where they do not perceive or that he would not seize them during their usual activities and they could not cause failure or that he would not seize them gradually in a state of dread but indeed your lord is kind and merciful verse number 48 have they not considered what things allah has created their shadows inclined to the right and to the left prostrating to allah while they are humble subhanallah the worst the worst provides a state of humility of humbleness of all the creations because of their prostration allah says what that the shadows of all the objects prostrate how is this so we know we know that we have observed that when the sun rises from the east, the shadows of the object, they are towards the west. Initially, the shadows are longer, but slowly and steadily as the sun starts rising, the size of the shadow goes on decreasing. And at midday or noon, when the sun is right in the center of the sky, there is no shadow at all. But when the sun starts moving towards the west, the shadows now, they move towards the east. And slowly and steadily, as the sun descends, the shadows also go on increasing in size. Now, it is this changing of the size and the direction is what Allah in Quran says, is the salah of the shadows. They're bending, they're standing, they're is what is their salah, is their qayam, is their raku, and is their sajood and their prostration before their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to convey to all those who are reading the verse that you need to realize, you need to ponder that even your shadow, that even your shadow prostrates before the Lord. So you yourself, you need to stop being ignorant. You need to stop being lazy about, about your salah and about your prostrations. Rabbi Jahalli Maqima Salati wa min Zuriyati. And remember that the true spirit of prostration is what removes all forms of arrogance and it instills, it instills humbleness in the bondsmen of Allah who prostrate to Allah. Verse number 49, Allah says, and to Allah prostrates whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth of creatures and the angels as well. They are not arrogant. So I repeat again, prostration takes out from the heart all forms of arrogance and prostration to Allah instills and infuses in our hearts humbleness. Verse number 50, they fear their Lord about them and they do what they are commanded. So this is the total link. When a person prostrates to Allah and when the person fears Allah, then what happens is the heart gets purified from arrogance. And when the heart gets purified from arrogance, then the person starts believing in the orders of Allah and the person becomes what? An obedient person or the obedient bondsman of Allah. And Allah has said, do not take for yourselves two deities. He is but one God, so fear me. And to him belongs whatever is in the heavens and on the earth. And to him is due worship constantly. Then it is. Is it other than Allah that you fear? And whatever you have of favor is from Allah. And then when adversity touches you, to him you cry out for help. Then when he removes this adversity from you, at once a party of you associates others with their lords. So they will deny what we have given them and then enjoy yourselves for you are going to know and they assign to what they do not know a portion of what which we have provided them 
by Allah, you will surely be questioned about what you used to invent. Verse 57, and they attribute to Allah daughters, exalted is he, and for them is what they desire. In this verse number 57, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the behavior, a negated behavior of the polytheists of Mecca. They had fabricated, they considered that the angels were feminine. And considering the angels as feminine, they fabricated the angels as the daughters of Allah. And they believed that the angels being feminine, they were the daughters of Allah. And then they made the idols of these angels and they used to worship these idols and they used to spend charity for the name of these angels and they slaughtered on their stations, all doing why? To please the angels. And they did why? Why did they try to please the angels? Because as all these acts of worships they did because they thought that the angels being the daughters of Allah, Nauzubillah, they were near and dear to Allah. So when they will be pleased with them, they will present our supplications to the Lord. Because, you know, they thought that the access to the Lord needed some source. And otherwise, they could not get their supplications to Allah directly. Although Allah has said in Quran, what? That I'm closer to my bondsman. How close, Allah says? As close to the main neck wane, that is the jugular of your neck. And secondly, they worshipped these angels to please them, imagining that the angels would intercede for them on the day of judgment. Verse number 58, and when one of them is informed of the birth of a female, his face becomes dark and he suppresses grief and he hides himself from the people because of the ill of what? Ill of which he has been informed. What? The birth of a daughter. Should he keep it in humiliation or bury it in the ground? Unquestionably evil is what they decide. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that they created daughters for Allah, but they dislike the same for themselves. The status of the people of Mecca regarding the daughters is what Allah has explained in this verse number 58 and 59, that when they got the news of the birth of a daughter, their faces became dark and they were grieved and they used to think that should she, uh, he let her live or should he bury her or should he kill her? So all things of the sort. They dislike daughters. They dislike daughters to the extent that they killed them to get rid of them. And why did they kill them? The basic reason was that like one of the reason was fear of economic loads. They thought that these daughters would be just feeding mouths and they will not be earning hands. And then they also knew that when the tribes would attack them, they would take away their daughters and they would make them slave girls. And this would be disgraceful for them. So you see, rather than being brave enough to protect their daughters and the women folk, they preferred killing them away. And the fourth reason why they used to kill their daughters was that they thought when she would get old and she would get married, then they would have to submit to the son-in-law. And also they, were, uh, they used to feel insecure that when she would get married, the son-in-law might demand her share of inheritance in the property also. So basically economic concerns. Economic concerns were the basic triggering factors. And we uh, learn of many companions narrating stories of how they had brutally killed their innocent daughters in their childhood. Some of them told them, uh, some of them told Prophet Sallallahu and confessed that he had thrown uh, his daughter in the well. And some of them narrated stories of how brutally he had buried his daughter while she was crying out and helping him and she was calling him out. And while they were narrating all these stories, Prophet Sallallahu used to cry. He used to cry because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also said in the Quran, the daughters who were killed on the day of judgment, they will be asked, for which sinful act were you killed? 
And we learn from the words and the teachings of the hadith. There are many traditions in which Prophet has explained the importance of good behavior and manner and conduct with the daughters. Prophet said, La takrihul banati inni abul banat. O believers, don't dislike daughters because I am what? I am the father of daughters. Prophet had four daughters and there was no life male issue. And then Prophet has been reported to say that when a daughter is born in a family, the angels of blessings, they descend and they announce that she is a weak being produced from a weak being. That is a mother and the daughter, both, they are both weak physically, emotionally, economically, socially, all forms. They are made that way, you know. She is a weak being produced, produced from a weak being. Whosoever will take charge of her economic commitments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will take charge of his economic commitments. Subhanallah. So these are daughters. They are no economic loads. They are, in fact, they bring with them the surety of economic stability of the family themselves. Prophet ﷺ has been reported to tell all of us that Abdullah bin Abbas who reports that Prophet ﷺ said, whoever becomes the father of a girl should neither hurt her nor treat her with contempt nor show preference over her to his sons in kindness and affection. That is, both of them should be treated equally. Allah will grant him paradise in return for kindly treatment towards the daughter. Then Prophet ﷺ has been reported by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The bondsmen are the bondswomen upon whom the responsibility of daughters was placed by Allah. And he or she fulfilled the responsibility in a good manner and treated them properly for him or her. The daughter shall be a means of protection from hellfire. In Muslim, there is a story narrated by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that there was a poor woman she had two daughters with her and she came to Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and she asked for charity. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha had three dates with her and she gave her the three dates. And she, the mother, she gave one date each to the two girls and she was about to put the third in her own mouth that the girl, after eating her own, asked for the second as well. And the mother, she did not eat the sacrifice selflessness she she did not eat it herself and gave this her date her part of the date also to her daughter and she ate it half of it to one and the half of it to the other she was like fair between the two of them and was so impressed that when prophet came she mentioned the whole event and he said on account of this very act of the woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave for her the decision of paradise and freedom from hellfire. So these are daughters. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala who has reported in Muslim that Prophet said, the bondsmen who bear the responsibility of two daughters and support them till they attain puberty. I will be close to one another like this on the day of judgment. And the narrator said that Prophet ﷺ showed by joining the two fingers, the middle finger and the index finger, how close he will be. Hazrat Abu Sayyid Khudri radiallahu ta'ala who reports that Prophet ﷺ said, whoever bears the responsibility of three daughters or sisters, or even two daughters or sisters, and bears it well, and looks after their training and welfare properly, and then gets them married, Allah will reward him with paradise. For those who do not believe in the hereafter is the description of evil and for Allah is the highest attribute and he is exalted in might and wise. And if Allah were to impose blame on the people for their wrongdoings, he would not have left upon the earth any creature, but he defers them for a specific term. And when their terms has come, they will not remain behind an hour, nor will they precede it. And they attribute to Allah that which they dislike and their tongues assert the lie that they 
that they will have the best from him. Assuredly, they will have the fire and they will be there in neglected. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. By Allah, we did certainly send messengers to nations before you, but Shaitan made their deeds attractive to them, and he is the disbeliever's ally today as well, and they will have a painful punishment. And we have not revealed to you the book of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except for you to make clear to them that wherein they have differed, and as a guidance and mercy for people who believe, and Allah has sent down rain from the sky and given life thereby to the earth after its lifelessness. Indeed, and that is a sign for people who listen. And indeed, for you in the grazing livestock is a lesson. We give you a drink from what is in their bellies between excretion and blood, pure milk, palatable to drinkers. And from the fruits of palm trees and grapevines, you take intoxicants and good provisions. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who reason. So from this verse, we need we we learn one main point is that a thing might not be prohibited or haram, but the method of using it will make it prohibited or unlawful or haram. Like here we see that there is a drink from the palm trees or the grape vines is what? The juice. This is permissible. This is very much halal. But if it is fermented, if it is, if we like, let it stand and ferment and convert it into wine, then it becomes what? It becomes prohibited. So similarly, the currency, the money, it is not prohibited itself, but the way it is earned, by the methods how it is earned, they make it unlawful or prohibited or haram. For example, if somebody earns by interest or usury or gambling or bribe, then it is, it is haram. But if it is earned by hard work and permissible labor, then it will be what? It will be duly halal. Verse number 68, and your Lord inspired to the bee. Take for yourselves among the mountains, houses, and among the trees, and in that which they construct. And then eat from all the fruits and follow the way of your Lord and lay down for you. There emerges from their bellies a drink, wearing in color, in which there is healing for the people. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who give thought. Now, in verse 68 and 69, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about An-Nahl, the honeybee. And it is these verses which give the chapter, the surah, its name. Honey bee is a tiny but a remarkable creation of Allah. And the hive of the bee is again a remarkable feat of architectural and geometrical performance. She learned it. How did she learn to do both these? She learned it from Auharabuka. The inspiration, the natural inspiration which was taught to the honeybee guides her to make the hive and the bee. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also guided her steps to make the honey. The tiny creature, a brain as minute as a pinhead. This tiny creature with the brain as minute as a pinhead, when obeys the orders of Al Alim, the results are spectacular the hive and the honey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all obey the orders of Allah, the do's and don'ts of Allah. How the honeybee does labor day in and out, how organized and methodical it is, how united. And fair, the system of the hive is how sincere, diligent, dutiful each worker of the hive is, how remarkable teamwork is exhibited, how planning, how saving and using with moderation we see in the hive. All the life of a honey bee, of the honey bee, it spends, it prepares. A max of about one to one and a half teaspoon of honey. Spending all the life, 
how valuable the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are, little do we realize. All the creations of Allah are at the service of the superior beings. Still how wasteful we are, leaving our foods in our dishes to be washed down or to be thrown down in the garbage bins. Rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ja'alli sabura wa ja'alli shukura. And Allah created you, and then he will take you in death. And among you is he who is reversed to the most old age so that he will not know. And after having had knowledge a thing of a thing, indeed Allah is knowing and competent. Allah here is mentioning about a special age, Ardhalil Umar, an old age. The person reverts to the condition of infancy. The condition of a child, hard of hearing, poor of vision, impaired speech and comprehension, disturbed sleep and appetite, unbalanced gait, loss of memory, and so, so much more. Prophet has taught us a supplication which he used to recite after Salah. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ardhalil umar. Allah has favored some of you over others in provision, but those who were favored would not hand over their provision to those whom their right hand possesses, so they will be equal to them therein. This is in the favor of Allah they reject. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here that in your daily life, you very well realize as well as you maintain the difference between the master and the slave. You realize the position of the master and you realize the status of the slave. And moreover, the master maintains his position and master maintains the position of the slave. But then what goes wrong where? That between the worldly master and the slaves, you maintain and you realize and you understand and you comprehend. But the relationship and the difference between the master of masters, between the leader of leaders, between the ruler of the rulers and his bondsmen, you mix it all up and you start making and fabricating deities and finding partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 72, and Allah has made for you from yourself maids and has made for you from your maids sons and grandsons and children and has provided for you from the good things. Then in falsehood, falsehood do they believe and in the favor of Allah they disbelieve. Allah has mentioned the blessing of the spouse, the wife, the sons, the grandsons. And despite receiving all the blessings, staying great, uh, thankless to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all realize the bountings and blessings and help us be grateful and develop this beautiful feeling of gratitude in our lives. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata ayunin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. And they worship besides Allah that which does not possess for them the power of provision for the heavens and the earth at all. And in fact, they are unable. So do not assert similarities to Allah. Indeed, Allah knows and you do not know. Allah presents an example, a slave who is owned and unable to do anything and unable to do a thing. And he to whom we have provided from us good provisions, so he spends from it secretly and publicly. Can they be equal? Praise to Allah, but most of them do not know. And Allah pres presents an example of two men, one of them dumb and unable to do a thing while he is a burden to his guardian. Wherever he directs him, he brings no good, he is equal, is he equal to the one who commands justice while he is on a straight path? Allahumma ihtina siratul mustaqim. 
and to Allah belongs the unseen aspects of heaven and the earth. And the commands for the hour is not, but as a glance of the eye or even nearer. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. And Allah has extracted from the wombs of your mothers, not knowing a thing. And he made from you hearing and vision and intellect that perhaps you be grateful. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura wa fi sam'i nura wa fi yamini nura wa an yassari nura Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura Do they not see the words controlled in the atmosphere of the sky Subhanallah, none holds them up except Allah. In, indeed, in that are the signs for people who believe. And Allah has made from you, from your homes, a place of rest, and made for you from the highs of the animals, tents, which you find light on the day of travel and your day of encampment, and from their wool, fur, and hair is furnishing an enjoyment for a time. And Allah has made for you from that which he has created shadows and has made for you from the mountains shelters and has made for you garments which protect you from the heat and garments which protect you from the enemy in battle. Thus does he complete his favor, his favor upon you that you might submit to him. But if they turn away, then only upon you is the responsibility of clear notification. They recognize the flavor of Allah and they then deny it. And most of them are disbelievers. And mention the day when we will resurrect from every nation a witness. And then it will not be permitted to disbelievers to apologize or make excuses, nor will they be asked to appease Allah. And when those who wronged see the punishment, it will not be lightened for them, nor will they be reprieved. And when those who associated others with Allah see their partners, they will say, O oh Lord, these are our partners to you whom we used to invoke beside you. But they will throw at them the statement, indeed, you are liars. And they will impart to Allah that day their submission and loss from them is what they used to invent. Those who disbelieve and averted others from the way of Allah, we will increase them in punishment over their punishment for what corruption they were causing. And mention the day when we will resurrect among every nation a witness over them from themselves. And we will bring you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a witness over your nation. And we have sent down to you the book as a clarification for all the things, as the guardians, as a guidance and mercy and good tidings for the Muslims. Verse 90. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allaha ya'muru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i fil qurba. Indeed, Allah orders justice, good con conduct, and giving to relatives, and forbids immorality and bad conduct and oppression. He admonishes you that perhaps you will be reminded. Now, in this verse number 90 of Surah An-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the three highlighted do's and don'ts of Quran. We do know and we do realize that all the verses of Quran are full of the commandments of Allah. All the verses of Quran, we get the do's and don'ts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> but here, highlighted, Allah orders, yanha, Allah forbids. These are the highlighted three do's and don'ts of Allah. So the do's are justice, good conduct, and spending and giving to the relatives of kin, and three don'ts, immorality, bad conduct, and oppression. The first do is adal, justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has worship, has uh, ordered in the verse eight of Surah Al Maida, taqwa, that be just, do justice, because this is near to piety. So pious people have been ordered to be just. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered in another verse of Quran, all of us, not just to do justice, but to stand up for justice as well. And here we will see that Allah has, Allah will say, in Allah yuhibbul muqsateen, that Allah loves those, all those who are just and who are fair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is all just al adil and the day of judgment, he will arrange to ensure this justice itself. Surah Araf, verse number eight, Allah says, Wal waznu nil haq. True and just will be the weights of that day. La yuzlimuna fatila. No one will be dealt with on the day of judgment. How? With unfair means, without justice. And what will be the extent of justice as Allah says, Weights, the balance, the scale will be set up for justice on the day of resurrection. And the weight of the scales will be sensitive so, so very sensitive that they will be able to detect the weight of the seed of a mustard or even the weight of a knit. So Allah is al-adil, all just. All the messengers, Prophet wasallam was so just. We find so many, so many events in the life of Prophet wasallam. Once there was a fight between Prophet Sallallahu cousin and a Jew regarding the issue of water for the fields. And the Jew was on the right stance and the Prophet Sallallahu cousins was not on the right stand. And Prophet Sallallahu decided against his cousin in favor of the Jew. And then we learn from a story of the Quran, how a hypocrite, a Muslim, he was a hypocrite, although he was a Muslim of uh, uh, the tribe of Banu Zafar and he stole something and after creating the, uh, a theft, he placed it in the custody of somebody, in, uh, in the trust of somebody, and then he put the blame on a Jew. And they, um, all the people, all the Muslims of Banu Zafar, they came pleading for his case, for uh, the person who had actually stolen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed with the verses who the actual thief was, and uh, the blame which had been put on the Jew was false. And so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he decided, the law of Sarka, according to the law of Sarka, the punishment to be given to whom? To the Jew and not to the Muslim. So there you are. And then there's another incident reported in Bukhari that uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his life, he was, um, there was a lady who was, uh, belonged to the family of the chief of uh, the tribe of uh, Banu Muhtum, And she also created a theft. And the proceeding was brought to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, he was um, just hearing the whole proceeding that Hazrat Osama, Hazrat Osama, uh, Osama, he came over. He was the beloved son of the adopted son of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zaid bin Haris. Hazrat Osama bin Zaid, Rasulullah Ta'ala, and he came over to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interceding for this, uh, for this lady. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was furious. And uh, it is narrated that his face went red. He got up and he said that don't you start following the doings of the people before you. They used to give punishments to the lower class of the society and they used to waver off the punishments from the upper class. By Allah, by Allah, a justly implemented law of Allah will be more useful for the community than the continuous rain for 40 days. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam added by Allah, if Fatima binti Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had created a theft, then I would have ordered that her hands be cut off also. So this is the precedence of justice. This is the fair play which was demonstrated 
in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were just, and they did justice. Hazrat Umar Allahu Ta'ala and who? He was the caliph and uh, his son was found guilty of drinking and the judge gave punishment of lashes and uh, it was the rule that the first few lashes were to be struck by the judge who had imposed the punishment. And uh, the day the lashes were to be uh, given, Hazrat Umar ta'ala, and who was also there to witness the prosecution. And the judge started striking, but out of courtesy to the Khalifatul Muslimin, he was doing all that a bit gently. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was furious to see this injustice and he got up, he snatched the lash from the judge's hand and he started lashing on the naked back of his own son. And while he was lashing, he was saying that, oh my son, on the day of resurrection, when you are presented before the court of Allah, be a witness that my father implemented the laws of Allah as a just ruler. Prophet Sallallahu has been reported in a tradition of Bukhari and Muslim that he said that seven people who will be on the day of judgment under the shade of the throne of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the first person will be a just ruler. So this is the importance of justice in, in Quran and in the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Remember, justice is mandatory for all forms of peace in a society. We see Allah is just, so there is peace and there's harmony in the universe. When there is prevalence of justice at all levels, there will be prevalence of peace. Allah is just, so there is peace in the universe. If there will be justice in the state, there will be peace in the state. If there will be justice in the society, in the homes, there will be peace in the society and in the homes. There has to be justice at all the levels, at this level of the state, at the level of the judiciary, at the level, at the social level, at the level of the society, there needs to be justice. Justice regarding admissions in the schools, in the colleges, in the universities, selections for jobs for appointments, promotions and postings, everywhere, at all occasions, at all places, for everyone, in everything, in every matter, will there be total justice and fair dealing. No false intercessions, no unfair, undue, unjust or biased dealings. Because you know, when all these decisions, they become they become unfair. Or when there is no justice in all these selections, this will lead to frustration of the qualified and the deserving individuals. And you know what? They may, they may turn into the delinquents of the society, frustrated. Then there has to be, there has to be justice at the domestic levels. Our children, daughters, and, and sons regarding our inheritance, our love, affection, the time we give to them, the importance we give to them. As I've just explained, when a father or a mother is put to trial with the daughters and the sons, and he does not prefer the sons over the daughters, he loves them, takes care, so, takes care of their requirements, educates them, trains them, and marries them, he will be, he will be like the two fingers are on the day of judgment with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is justice between the children, the sons and the daughters. But I would need to clarify this justice between the daughters and the son because this is being misused and misunderstood also. What happens is treating the daughter and the son, people are getting confused. What happening is today, what happens today is that a daughter comes up saying that if the brother can stay out late, why can't I? If the brother can drive a bike, why can't I? If the brother can grow abroad studying alone, why can't I? If the brother doesn't cover his head, why must I? Why must I cook, clean, wash in the house when he does not? Remember, she has to be taught. Both the son and the daughter have to be taught that they are different physically, emotionally, integrally, socially, 
they have been made as different, different, and they have different affairs of life, and they have different duties in their life. They have to be taught all this, because if the daughter is not taught all this in the house of the parents, she will never submit to her husband after her marriage. And this tendency of like irrational debate, this will keep on continuing in the rest of the life also. So we need to understand what being just among the children is. Then we need to be, we need to be just in our dealings with our parents and our in-laws, his parents and my parents in dealing with the in-laws of our children. You must have seen and experienced that when the in-laws of the daughters, they are served, they are served lavishly. And when we take guests, the in-laws of our sons, they are not served all that lavishly. Remember, these things don't go unnoticed. They are felt, they are registered, they hurt. And the memory, the marks, they stay. And the relations and the bonds, they are affected because of this biased and unfair dealings. We need to be fair and just in all our worldly human dealings to the finest details. We need to be just between our daughter and our son-in-law. If the fault is with my daughter, I have to highlight it. If my son has wronged, I need to accept it. I need to be fair in my dealing with my son and with my son-in-law. If I want my, my son-in-law to respect me, to care for me, to visit me, I don't have to start getting upset when I see my son doing the same with his mother-in-law. I have to be fair in my dealing for my daughter and my daughter-in-law. If I want my daughter to come over for the weekend to stay over, if I want my grandchildren to stay over, I should not be unhappy and, and uncomfortable when my daughter-in-law goes to visit her parents. I need to be fair and just in my dealings with my sisters and my brothers. We, we need to think, we women folk, we normally we are generally somehow more inclined toward our sisters, socializing, talking, sharing, outing, leaving out our brothers. And this is usually, usually because he happens to be the husband to our disliked sister-in-law. And we just ignore our brothers and we indulge in all forms of interactions and dealings and sharings with our sisters. This is not fair. We need to be fair and we need to be just in all forms of dealings of our human relationships. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us relate to all the orders of our Quran and be a practicing Muslim. And fulfill the covenant of Allah when you have taken it, O believers, and do not break oaths after their confirmation while you have you have made with Allah over you a fitness. Indeed, Allah knows what you do. And do not be like a woman who untwisted her spun thread after it was strong by taking your oaths as mean of deceit between you because one community is more plentiful in number or worth or wealth than another community. Allah only tries you thereby and he will surely make clear to you on the day of resurrection that over which you used to differ. Now in this verse 92, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the condition of a woman who spins a thread or who weaves her cotton, but after that is silly and foolish enough to cut it into pieces or to tear it into pieces. Like she's wasting all her effort and time. So in this, <coughs> so in this example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to, wants to convey to us 
that we need to save ourselves from indulging in actions or activities which will lead to wasting of all our righteous and virtuous deeds. Now, I would make a short list here of few such sins which will wash away the virtuous deeds. As Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal atha. Kallazi yunfiku ma lahu riyaan nasi, wa la yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhir. O people, you believe, do not waste your charity by doing what? Bil man wal adha. Like hurting people or by doing what? You will waste your charity you make in the path of Allah will go waste. The reward will be wasted if after spending, you start showing off, you do riya, you boast off, or you start taunting and hurting the person you've given the money. Then envy, being envious or jealous of a person leads to wasting of all the good deeds. Then a person performing salah, but without proper evolution. Evolution is what? Wudu is what? It is the key to salah. But when a person is offering salah, but without proper wudu or evolution, then the salah will be wasted. As Prophet saw a person who was doing wudu and his heels, a part of the skin of the heel was dry. And Prophet called out to him and said, that if you're going to offer your salah after this, the salah, which is the miftahul jannah, which is the key to paradise, despite you offering the salah, if your wudu is not complete, then the dried heels will be what? They bring the good tidings. They bring the tidings for what? For nar, for the hellfire. And then we learn from the teachings of Prophet Wasallam that there's one good deed, one, one sin, which is going to destroy the reward of all the good deeds. And this is what? Disobedience and misbehavior with the parents. And then, as Allah says, in the shirk Allah zulmun azim, polities and finding partners and deities with Allah, this also needs to the wasting of all the good deeds. Nothing will be accepted. So what we, need, uh, what we need to do is we need to be cautious. It's not only important to do righteous deeds, but to also protect them from being wasted. Prophet Sallallahu asked his companions, you know, you realize who the needy person of my ummah will be on the day of judgment? The miskeen of my ummah on the day of judgment will be a person who had in his life he had a lot of righteous and virtuous and good deeds, like he had been praying, offering salah and fasting and done his hajj, performed his pilgrimage. And he had a lot of, lot of virtuous deeds in his records. But when his record of deeds was open, it will be open in his life. He might have taunted or hurt somebody. He might have humiliated somebody. He might have abused or hurt somebody. So what will happen is all his good deeds will be given off to all those he had oppressed. And then when his good deeds will finish, then their sins will be placed his, in his scales and his balance. Allahumma, Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. And if Allah had willed, he could have made you of one religion, but he causes to stray whom he wills and guides whom he wills. And you will be surely questioned about what you used to do. And do not take your oaths as means of deceit between you, lest a foot slip after it was once form, and you would taste evil in this world for what people you diverted from the way of Allah, and you would have in hereafter a great punishment, and do not exchange the covenant of Allah for a small price. What small price? The worldly advantages. Indeed, what is with Allah is the best for you, if only you could know. Whatever you have will end, but what Allah has lasting, and we will surely give those who were patient their reward according to the best of what they used to do. 
whoever does righteousness, whether male or female, remember there's no gender discrimination in Islam. While he is a believer, we will surely cause him to live a good life and we will surely give them their reward in hereafter according to the best of what they used to do. So when you recite the Quran, first do what? Seek refuge in Allah from shaitan, the expelled from his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse 98 instructs the proper manner to recite the Quran. Once we start the recitation of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us to recite what? Why do we need to do so? Because we know Allah has warned us, He is our enemy. He was turned out of Jannah because he refused to prostrate to Adam salam and there and then he took an enmity and he announced and declared that he will try to stop all the human beings from the path to Jannah. And he prevents he will prevent all the human beings from entering into Jannah. So he does what? He deters all the stages of our connection from recitation to a recitation of the Quran, which is going to help us, lead us to the path of Jannah and to help us and guide us for the obedience of Allah to acquire Jannah. So that is why we need to supplicate consciously not just utter these words but to supplicate consciously before we start the recitation of quran indeed there is for him no authority about those who have believed and rely upon their lord his authority is only over those who take him as an ally and those who through him associate others with Allah. And when we substitute a verse in the place of verse, Allah is most knowing of what he sends down. They say, you are but an inventor of lies, but most of them do not know. Say, the pure spirit who, Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam, has brought it down what the uh, the revelations of quran and the revelation and the verses of quran it down from your lord in truth to make firm those who believe and as a guidance and good tidings to the muslims and we certainly know that they say it is only a human being who teaches the prophet the tongue of the one they refer to is foreign and this quran in a clear arabic language Indeed, those who do not believe in the verses of Allah, Allah will not guide them, and for them is a painful punishment. The only, they only invent falsehood who do not believe in the verses of Allah, and it is those who are the liars. Verse 106, whoever disbelieves in Allah after his belief, except for one who is forced to renounce his religion while his heart is secure in faith. But those who willingly upon their breasts do disbelieve, upon them is the wrath from Allah, and for them is a great punishment. Now, this verse has been revealed on the account that Muslims in Mecca were being, were being persecuted. And they were being persecuted to revert them to Islam. And there is a incidents of Hazrat uh, Amar bin Yasir anhu. he was put under a similar situation and he was tortured he was tortured till he announced his disbelief and then he was set free when set free he came crying to Prophet وسلم, and he said Prophet وسلم, they would not leave me until I uttered disbelief Prophet asked him, Kaifa tajid kalbika? That how did you find your heart at that time? He said, Iman, that I was content and that I was satisfied with Iman. Prophet told him, in adu fa'ud, that if they do so again, you do the same again also. So it is permitted by this, these words of Prophet and by this words, it is permitted that in 
severe persecution, a person might announce that he disbelieves to save himself from the torture and persecution. But we learn from the stories of the companions of Prophet Sallallahu that they did not even avail of this. They did not avail of this permission. They were pillars of patience. They were pillars of patience who set exemplary models of ultimate patience for all of us. Parts of body being chopped off, parts of body being cut off, and they still, they still announcing la ilaha illallah by the words of mouth. So this is patience, which was shown by the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is because they preferred the worldly life over the hereafter and that Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. Those are the ones over whose hearts and hearing and vision Allah has sealed. And it is those who are the heatless. Assuredly, it is they in the hereafter who will be the losers. Then indeed your law to those who, are, those who immigrated after they had been compelled to renounce their religion and thereafter fought for the cause of Allah and were patient. Indeed, your Lord after that is forgiving and merciful. On the day when every soul will come disputing for itself and every soul will be fully compensated for what it did, they will not be wronged. And Allah presents an example, a city which was safe and secure, its provisions coming to it in abundance from every location, but it denied the favors of Allah. So Allah made it taste the envelopment of hunger and fear for what they had been doing. Doing. And there had certainly come to them a messenger from among themselves, but they denied him. So punishment overtook them while they were the wrongdoers. Then eat of what Allah has provided for you, which is lawful and good, and be grateful for the favors of Allah, if it is indeed in him that you worship. He has only forbidden to you dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. But whoever is forced by necessity, neither desiring it nor transgressing its limits, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. And do not say about what your tongues assert of untruth. This is lawful and this is unlawful to invent falsehood about Allah. Indeed, those who invent falsehood about Allah will not succeed. It is but a brief enjoyment and they will have a painful punishment. And to those who are Jews, we have prohibited that which we related to you before and we did not wrong them thereby, but they were wronging themselves. Then indeed, your Lord, to those who have been wrong out of in who have done wrong out of ignorance and then repent after that, are correct themselves and correct themselves. Indeed, your Lord thereafter is forgiving and merciful. Indeed, Ibrahim salam, was a comprehensive leader, devoutly obedient to Allah, inclining towards truth, and he was not of those who associate others with Allah. Continuously in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in one or the other way, continuously negating all forms of polytheistic beliefs. He was grateful for his flavors. For his favors, Allah chose him and guided him to a straight path. Allah guides those who stay away from polytheism and Allah guides those who are grateful for his favors. And we gave him good in this world and indeed in hereafter he will be among the righteous. And then we reveal to you to follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, inclining towards the truth. And he was not those who associate with Allah, the Sabbath, was only appointed for those who differed over it. And indeed, your Lord will judge between them on the day of the resurrection concerning that over which they used to differ. Invite to the way of your Lord. So in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us the wisdom of how to invite others towards the obedience of Allah. 
Invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instructions. And if you have to argue, do what? And argue with them in a way that is best. Indeed, your Lord is most knowing of who has strayed from his way, and he is most knowing of who is rightly guided. And if you punish an enemy or believers, punish with an equivalent of that which you have been harmed. But if you were patient, it is better for those who are patient. So we can take revenge, but when we are revengeful, we have to be exactly equal in taking the revenge to what we were harmed. If we exceed, then we will turn into the oppressor and the person will be the oppressed. And be patient. Your patience is not by but through Allah and do not grieve over them and do not be in distress of what they conspire. Indeed, Allah is with those who fear and those who are the doers of good. So the last three messages in the verse number 127 and 128, the last three messages are to be patient, to fear Allah, have piety and be pious and to be doers of good. Allahumma ja'alni saburam wa ja'alni shakura. Allahumma ja'alni saburam wa ja'alni shakura. Wa ja'alni fi aini saghira wa fi a'yunin nasi qabira. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma inni a'uzu bika min mukirat al-akhlaq. Wal a'mal wal ahwai wal adwa. Rabbana, la tuzir qulubana, bada is khadaytana wa khablana millatun ka rahma, inna ka anta al-wahab. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastakbiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil aizzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ameen summa ameen.